started. I just wanted to share, actually, before we get started, um, for I hope that you've had a chance to have a look at this particular case study uh, that uh, that Dimwood is going to take us through today. I just wanted to share with you how to access it if you haven't had a chance to do that. I'm just going to share what it looks like. So if you go on, you should be able to see my screen, I think. And um, if you go onto the group, um, and just go to the home page of the group and under um, more there is a section called message boards and in there I've put a whole lot of links there so there is a link for all of the past solutions so that's how you can access that there and when you go to it this is what it looks like so it's just a google drive folder and if you go into um, 2021 and there's only one stage in there now because we've only done stage one. And so you'll be able to download it like that. So I'm just going to pop the, um, in a second, I'm going to pop, I'll pop the link in there again for people, for anybody who hasn't been able to access it. So if you um, have had a chance to have a look at this question in advance, that is great. So welcome, dear Maud. I will introduce you and let you have the floor in a second. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you. It is um, really exciting to have a, uh, a bloke. So it's the first time. <laughs> this is actually the first time that we've had a, uh, a male in here. So uh, very, very exciting. So um, Dimwood. <laughs> What's that? I said the pressure is even higher now. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just take, I've just taken a screenshot. Actually, I'll do another one. Is everybody ready? Smile. Hi, Jessica. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, because I uh, just wanted to take a take a photo of everybody. Um, all right. Um, so Diermud is uh, a a champion financial modeler. So he is currently, I think, you're number three. That's just going off this, the, the results from stage one. I think it was, was it back in 2014 that you won model off? Have I got my dates right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're usually in the top, like one, two, three, four, five of, of modelers. So what we're really hoping to get out of this session is to find out a little bit more about how your mind works, how we can become champion financial modelers. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. And thank you so much for joining us. It's um, fantastic to hear from you, Dimwood. No, I'm, I'm very happy to join. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Like I said, I, I feel a little, little pressure as the, the first male guest of the group. <laughs> I know. Well, we've, got, we've only been going for a couple of months, so we haven't had that many. <laughs> I'm sure you won't be the last. <laughs> So um, this was a shocker. Um, I had, I had, I was just telling Dim earlier. Um, I had an absolute nightmare of it. I was doing okay until I got to these two questions were horrendous. And um, I tried this one. I thought, oh, Power Query, great, and I completely stuffed it up. And I wish I'd just done it manually from the beginning. But you sort of think, oh, it's you know, you're under the time pressure. And then the other one I found really hard as well. So I had a bit of a nightmare. So um, yeah. So yeah, tell us a little bit about the um, about the case, Dimwood, and why you chose to do that one. Sure. <clears throat> um, so let me just I'll uh, I'll share my screen quickly and just show you a little bit of uh, of what it looks like, and then I'll kind of explain a little bit more on motivation. Uh, so, I mean, it, there's a lot more detail in the thing, but the, the core of it was you've got this large set of headcount files with you know some variations in the format of like what different information is in there covering you know a many year period every quarter um and you're trying to you know trying to convert that into sort of answering questions about how the company has grown and how long people stick around and attrition rates by when they joined and so on and so forth um it, you know it's it's pretty closely related to i mean honestly i um I, you know, Andrew asked me to, like he talked to me about writing questions before, but then he asked me a few weeks back, hey, any chance you could do one for round one? And I said, uh, okay, I'll think of something. <laughs> um, and then, you know, around that time, I, I was doing approximately this thing at work. So, you know, we have, 
headcount files like this going back, you know, many years. They're all in different files rather than different tabs, but similar thing. It's like it's mostly the same, but exactly what fields are included has changed over time. And you know, columns aren't always in the same place. You know, maybe the header that, row isn't always in the same that's place. That's what got me because in the question it said something about the columns will always be in the same um, the same order or something. And so I just assumed that all of the tabs were exactly the same. I didn't read it properly. Uh -huh. And that's so, so what I, me. I, I, I don't remember exactly. I, I know it meant, I meant that, I meant to say that you could assume that the header row was always in the same place. Yes, that's what And maybe that whichever fields were included appeared in the same order. Um, I, I don't remember. But of exactly. course they were all different, which is natural. Um, but yeah, it's, Definitely and part of the challenge is that it's, it's, you know, I mean, most, sorry, I'm not sharing anymore, but I mean, most of it is, is kind of fluff. Like I actually spent a lot of time making lots of dummy data that was totally irrelevant to the question and didn't get used. I thought some of it might, but I didn't anyway. Um, but it, basically all that mattered was the employee ID, um, you know, which employee IDs were present on which tabs. Um, and so, you know, the, the sort of core of answering the question, analyzing the past data was trying to extract a list of which employee IDs are on which tabs in a, in a sort of neat way. Um, and yeah, that was obviously complicated significantly by the fact that it, it's not always in the same place. Like it starts off at the second column and then as other things get added, it, it migrates its way over the page. Um, and so, yeah, basically the idea was, I mean, so the real life situation, like I said, we, we have data just like this and we were looking at, okay, we're planning our, you know, fixed pay budget for next year. Uh, you know, we have a group of, uh, like our, our analysts are on a mid-year cycle. So basically, you know, we're budgeting fixed pay increases for certain people who are getting promoted at the end of the year and we already know who that is. And then we have a group of analysts who are of a class that would be eligible to be promoted by the middle of the year, but we don't want to budget for everyone still going to be here and get a fixed pay increase because it's the nature of investment banking, lots of analysts leave. And so the question was, you know, based on the last several years of data, what proportion of analysts leave between, you know, now, which is early January and the middle of August, which is when they would get paid. Um, and so it's, you know, very similar to what this question asks you to do. Um, so, yeah, basically the, like I said, the, the, the crux of it is trying to get the data into a, a kind of neat usable position. And I mean, to, to Danielle's point, it, there's always, in exam conditions, there's always a real trade-off of, you know, oh shit, I haven't got much time. Like, maybe I'm better to just go into each tab and copy and paste it out. Um, and I, I, you know, it's a kind of finger in the air, but I tried to set it so that the number of tabs was big enough that that was intimidating, off-putting, but not completely impossible if you, you know, decided to go that way. Um, but there was certainly a pretty high commitment cost. Like if you started if you started doing it one way and then realize actually, wait, this isn't working out, I'm just gonna do it manually, you've probably burned enough time that you're not gonna have enough time left to do it manually, um, which, which was kind of deliberate. It's, you know, if you, like, it's not totally impossible to do it manually, but it's very hard. Um, and the reason I did it that way is because I, I think it's, it's often hard in a situation where it's like, you know, boil this real world task that takes a day or a week or more down to something that you can do in, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes. It, it's hard to reward people for like good design and efficiency in the way that the real world does just by the fact that you're going to use this again, you know, next week, next month, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, basically my, my way of doing that was just making it pretty big and pretty ugly so that if you could think of a neat way to do it, you'd speed yourself along. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll do a quick little bit of kind of demo of a few different, um, few different ways to approach it. Uh, and then, you know, obviously jump in with questions at, at any point. That sounds um, great. So I'll go back to sharing my screen. So I've got the file here, so I'm just gonna, whoops, put in. So like I said, simplest option is you can basically 
take each month, or each quarter, sorry, and just whatever, manually type in. That's the name of the tab. That's the data that's there. Um, it's, and again, as I talk through this, like in an exam situation where you have to do this in an hour, I actually don't think that's a crazy strategy. Like I said, I, I put a lot of tabs in there, but at the same time, the risk is you try to set up something smarter and you get partway through and realize it's not working and you've got nothing out of it. Um, you know, obviously there's risks if you do it manually as well, um, you know, that you might miss something and there's basically no way of ever knowing that you missed something um, unless you just go and do it all again and see if you get the same answers. Um, but I mean, basically as I'm talking about it now, I'm thinking mostly about you know, if, if you had to do something like this in the real world where, you know, A, you, you probably have more than 40 minutes, but B, you know, it's more important to know if you got the answer right, to have some degree of auditability so that, you know, something is linked back to the underlying data or better yet to have some degree of flexibility so that let's say, you know, three months later, we've got another quarter end headcount file. You know, can you refresh this and tell me what the new answers are? Um, so obviously lots of different ways to do this. I, in my mind, the next step up from doing it this way would be something like, uh, let's say we put in quarter end and we put in a date format so that we can actually uh, kind of, you know, formulaically move on to the next one um, and then MP ID, but then do the formula in a very manual way. So this might be something like, just go there and then I could just copy this down until, okay. So whenever I get to zero, that means that I've run out of employees for that one. And then I would just say whatever equals end of month that three. So in other words, go the end of three months later that gets me to my next quarter. And then I would just manually change this one to six, go back up to row, whatever, two, two is blank. Sorry, go back up to row three is the header, so four and then copy on down from there. And again, I'm sorry. And and keep going like that. And so that way, at least, you know, you end up with something where you've got whatever, 30 different formulas down the column, but at least all the original data is linked back to. Um, and then whatever, if you realized, okay, we actually had to add some more data in whatever, in this first quarter or something like, you know, if you had to make some adjustment after the fact like that, you could come back here and say, okay, I'll just copy down one more row. Um, so it's, it's like quite manual, especially in the setup, but there's at least some degree of it's linked back to the data. Um, and then the next step up from that in one sense, although it's quite messy, which I'll show you, uh, is, sorry, my computer is quite slow. Uh, and all of your faces are sitting on top of, here it is, alt solution, that's the one. So the next step up from that in one sense is to say basically automate all those steps. So like figure out how far down do you have to, you know, how many, um, you know, how far down do you switch to the next quarter? How, you know, what column are the employees in and, and go find all that. And so if any of you competed, or I guess, Danielle, your, your link will have this as well. Uh, the, the solutions that the competitors got include this alternative solution, which is um, it, it's sort of a bit of a straw man to make you appreciate the virtue of doing it the Power Query way, which I'll come to in a minute, because you know, it's, it's neat from a computer science perspective, but it's also extremely slow to calculate. But so what's going on here, this is basically saying, I've got one uh, table that's summarizing the tabs. So I just have quarter end, uh, and I just use that same end of month to get the list of the quarter ends from whatever the first quarter of 2013 to the last quarter of 2020. Uh, and then I format that using the text formula to get the name of the tab, uh, which is year dash month. And then I count 
uh, the number of employees. And that's, so basically all, all the formulas that refer to the tab use indirect, which is uh, basically a way of building a formula reference out of a text string. So in other words, whatever, if I say, I wanna reference the first employee ID here, that's 2013.03b4. And then I wanna reference the first one here, that's 2013.06b4. You'd like to be able to take advantage of the fact that you know the tab names are consistent, the employee ID is in the same place, so you can go find it. And the way to do that is to have a formula that says, you know, plug in this text, whatever, 03, 06, 09, 12, et cetera. And the formula that does that is indirect. Uh, so this says, you know, go to that tab, go to cell A3, and I've put the header row as an assumption up here. So, you know, if the structure changed on all of them, you could adapt to that. If it changed on just one of them, that would be a problem. Um, so I'm basically saying, you know, how many things starting from four down, so whatever, there's 35 people here, and on this one over here, there's 418 people. Uh, and so that, that count comes out here, so I've got the 35 there, the 418 there. Then what column is the employee ID in? Again, I use indirect to say, build a reference to row three on each different tab. And then I match emp ID against that because again, you're in the real world. You know the header rows might not always be in the same place, and emp ID might sometimes be employee ID. But you have to make some assumptions. And so in this one, you were told you can assume it's always called emp ID and it's always in the third row. Uh, and so that that gives you that. And then this one, uh, this then builds that table that I was building manually before that says, okay, here are the 35 people on the first tab. And then I've got a count that says 35. So when I get up to 35, I say, okay, now it's time to tick over to a new tab, start back at one again and start pulling the employees from there and so on. So it's formulaically speaking, it's very neat. It's so clunky and slow to calculate that you would almost never want to use it in the real world because you know this, I mean, download the file and try it yourself. Like just try moving anything around. It's, there's so many indirects and indirects are not super efficient. So it's just, it works and it's neat. And in the sense that, you know, if you added more tabs or went into a tab and added a bunch of new, of new employees or something, as long as you obeyed the same structural rules that, you know, the employee ID is always in row three, it's always called emp ID and that there are no blank rows, then this would adapt the only thing you'd have to do is expand the number of rows in the table to keep up. Um, but like I said, super, super inefficient to calculate. Um, so my kind of personal preferred solution, and I, I think a much neater solution is uh, to use Power Query. Uh, and so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious how many of you uh, know or have used Power Query in the past, but at least my general experience is most people haven't touched it. Um, and a pretty large proportion of people haven't even heard of it, is my sense. Um, let's see, people are chatting. But of course, you'd expect that if they were competing, they would have at least a passing uh, knowledge of it. Uh, maybe, maybe, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, honestly, I know some people who are very, very, very good at Excel, um, who never touch Power Query, have no idea what it can do. Be interesting. Could you just, for those people who are here, maybe you could just give a thumbs up on the reactions like I've just done there to say if you, if you feel like you've got at least a passing knowledge of how to use Power Query. So few people. Okay. Let's see the okay. cool. That's uh, more than I would have guessed, honestly. Uh, cool. So I, I think the way to reference it that more people will be, uh, sorry, let me just, I was reading this question and got distracted. Would it make it faster to set a reference to the last row and the max number of rows and do the indirect? 
Um, I, I think the challenge, the thing that, so I don't know if you guys can see this question that's up on my screen. The question was, would it be faster to reference the last row of each tab to find the, sorry, instead of referencing the last row of each tab to find the maximum number of rows on any tab and do the indirect reference to that last row. I think the challenge is for every, um, for every employee ID you want to pull off any tab, there'd need to be at least one indirect, which I think it maxes out at about 5,000 employees. So whatever, it's probably, I don't know, tens of thousands um, of rows that you would need to indirect, even if you knew the right place to look. And if you were going by the max row, then you'd potentially have even more because then you'd be looking at 5,000 per tab. So I, I think that would still be pretty rough. Um, so just quick background on Power Query, and then I'll, I'll sort of show you how this one works. Um, so I think the context it'll probably be familiar to most people from is if I tell you it's, it's sort of like mini access within Excel. Um, so, you know, it, I think more people are familiar with access as a tool for, you know, managing and manipulating data in databases, um, querying, extracting, transforming, that kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, let, let me just show you quickly. Uh, uh, how do I make this smaller? Mm, I can't. Okay. Uh, can I move it? Oh, here we go. Uh, all right. I can't see my ribbon here with this uh, zoom toolbar along the top. Okay. Hang on. Wait. I can take it off the top. Good. Okay. Sorry. Forget all that. Uh, so, let's just do a simple. Query. Uh, oh, sorry, got to enable content. Uh, yes. So I'm just starting this off in the kind of the simplest way that you can, which is, you know, if you click in a table anywhere and hit, you know, query starting from table, then it'll, uh, it'll open you up something here. I will warn you, my computer is super slow. It's not the power query is this slow. Um, so, you know, if you just very kind of quick tour of the high level things you can do, you know, you can remove columns, filter data, uh, you know, split by, group by. You'll see some of this when I do an actual demo here. Uh, this stuff over here gets into much more powerful, but also slightly out of the scope of what we're doing here, merging queries. Um, you can do amazing things when you start, you know, merging queries with themselves and, and other things. Um, but basically, whatever you do gets recorded as applied steps over here. And then whatever comes out at the end, uh, you know, drops out like this as a table in Excel. And uh, where is properties? Uh, no, wrong one. This is not the version of Power Query I'm used to using, so I'm slightly clunky here. Uh, where? Yeah, there it is, show queries. Um, so you get a query here that comes out as a table in Excel and where any time you can hit refresh and it'll go back to whatever, oh, I must have moved this since I made it. Uh, anyway, that's fine. Uh, anytime you hit refresh, it'll, uh, it'll run the whole query again, going back to your original data source. So, if none of that makes sense, hopefully it'll make a little more sense when I show you quickly uh, what I did here. So I'm, I'm going to close this one down. Uh, I'll, I'm just going to build a sort of minimum version of it, and then I'll talk a little bit about the differences between that and the one, the one that I made. So I'm going to go new query from file from workbook. Uh, it's on, sorry, I should say it's on, in most of the recent versions, it's on the data tab under get and transform then new query from file. So I'm going to go to the competitor file, hit import. Uh, something else in the chat. Oh, yes, I agree with that. Ask questions anytime. So this opens up, you know, this is the file and these are all the tabs under it. So if you just click on the folder for the whole file and then hit transform data, it brings you in brings you in here. And so you've got the list of all the tabs, the name, the kind. So these are all sheets, but if, you're, uh, if your file has tables in it, it'll list those as, as separate rows. If it has named ranges, it'll list those as separate rows. So you can, 
you know, pick out data that way as well. Um, and it shows you if it's hidden or not. But the main thing is this table is all the data in that tab. So if I click on that, it'll open up. Okay, here's, uh, you know, here are all the people in the employee IDs on that tab. So basically what we want to do, I'll show you the, the kind of more and less straightforward ways, but basically what we want to do is mash all of these together. Um, so first thing I'm gonna do is just drop the tabs, the assumptions, bonus sheet cover and data that don't have headcount data on them. And then if the layout was the same on all of them, you could literally just click this uh, and open it up. And this is just giving you the first two columns of every file. So, you know, here's the 35 people on the first tab with their employee IDs. Then here's all the people on the second tab. Um, two problems with this. Obviously, one is the employee ID is not always among the first two columns. Uh, and so if you load up whatever the first 10 columns from every tab, you'll have all the employee IDs, but they'll all be in different places. Um, and then the second problem, that's, obviously, that was my that's where I went wrong, I think, because I assumed that and I didn't scroll down far enough. And then when I got into Excel and started using it and then found that there was all this garbage right down the bottom. And so it hadn't come through properly. Yep. And then the second problem that you'll have is uh, that it's, you know, it's got the, the header from up at the top of the file, the blank row, and then the header row with name and emp ID. So that's gonna be repeated for every tab, which you don't really want. So if the data was very clean other than that, then that would be kind of fine. You could just, you know, filter out anything that starts with ABC co, filter out nulls, filter out name and emp ID and whatever. Um, but because it's not as neat as that, uh, what we're going to want to do is basically tidy it up a bit. And this is, in my mind, this is where you might start to appreciate somewhat of how magical this thing is. So let me just pick one of them at random to open up, click on table. And now one thing to warn you is sometimes Power Query tries to be helpful and, and isn't necessarily as helpful as it thinks it is. So. I mentioned that it records all the steps. So, you know, first you go to this source, then you filter to remove all these different names. Then you go to this particular sheet and you'll see it's also trying to be helpful added in a couple of other steps, which is promote the headers, meaning take whatever's in the first row and make that into the headers. Uh, and then it's just tried to figure out the right types. So, you know, make this type text, make this type text, make this type number or whatever, um, which, you know, sometimes it's helpful, but it's just, it's important to be aware that when you, when you do something like that, where you're expecting to just do one step, it may have added several steps, which you don't always want. So in this case, I'm just going to delete the extra steps helpfully offered. Uh, and then I'm going to think about what do I want to do? So I'm, I'm using this one as an example, and then I'll show you how to kind of efficiently apply it to all of them. So what do I want to do to this? Well, first I want to get rid of the empty rows. So remove top rows, top two, and hit enter. And then I want to use the first row as headers. And then the nice thing about Power Query is it thinks in terms of column names rather than whatever. In Excel, no matter what you call your table headers, you're always referring to column C, column D, column X. Power Query thinks in terms of table headers. So having done this, it now thinks of the emp ID column. It doesn't matter where that is, that is now a thing. So I can just, you know, remove other columns. And now I've just got the employee IDs. And all I've told it is remove everything except employee ID. And so no matter what columns are there, what order, what anything, as long as there's a column called emp ID, it will pull that column only out. Uh, but actually for now, we don't even need to do that. Just those first two steps are basically enough because now we've got, you know, we've got it in a kind of neat database format where it recognizes where the employee ID is. So basically what we want to do is take, uh, I'm sorry, again, when I promoted headers, it by default looked at types and tried to figure out the types. I'm just gonna delete that step. So these are the two steps that I want to apply to everything. First, remove the two empty rows and then make the third row the headers except instead of just navigating to one sheet and applying it to that, I want to do it to all of them. So uh, let me just see. You, when you're in Power Query, you might have to tick this box here to see it. 
uh, you can tick for a formula bar uh, and that'll show you the code that makes it up uh, or you can hit advanced editor and it will show you a little bit like recording a macro in VBA. It's like, this is, this is the real code of how to do all these things we've just done. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, you can do a lot just completely through the user interface. There's, there's a lot of helpful stuff here, but once you learn how to make kind of small manipulations in the code, you'll get a lot more powerful. So as an example, so I want to take each of these tables here. I want to remove the top rows and I want to promote the headers. And the reason that I did it in this example is because I can look at these and you can look at these if you don't know Power Query super well to get the syntax. So I'm going to go advanced editor. So whatever table I get out, first I want to skip the first two rows, which is table.skip, whatever it's called, and then comma two. And then I want to promote headers with this comma promote all scalers equals true. So I'm going to combine those into one by just taking the outside of that, putting it there, taking the start of this and putting it here. So now I have something that says, and again, it's just like nesting Excel formulas. So now I have something that says, skip the first two rows and then promote the headers. And Except that, that Excel exactly. formulas don't have that helpful little tick at the bottom that says no errors have been detected. Although Excel formulas have a lot of other things to help you out that Power yeah. Query doesn't. Uh, but yes, it's true that no syntax errors is, is a help. Um, that's this thing down here, uh, in case people didn't spot it. So now I'm just going to take this formula. I'm going to hit copy. I'm going to close out of there. And then I'm going to kill this, kill this, kill this, get back to just my list of all the tabs. And then I'm going to add column, uh, or add custom column. And I'll just call it whatever format table. And then I'm going to paste that formula in here. And then instead of, so this bit in the middle here is the bit that referred to the table I'm applying all this to. So I'm just going to apply that to the table that's in the data column. So this is one thing that conceptually is a bit of a leap if you're used to kind of regular Excel is that, you know, in this one cell, there is a whole table of data and you have functions that you can apply to whole tables of data, just like you have functions that can apply to cells or ranges or whatever. And so I'm basically adding a new column here that says, take this table, drop the first two rows and then promote the headers. Uh, so, Token end, oh, sorry. So one of the things that it's quite picky about is in uh, in the advanced editor, every statement except the last one ends with a comma. So when I copied that formula, I kept the comma, which is it's grumpy about now. So I have to delete the comma uh, and then I hit okay. And so now I've got tables where the headers are all neatly aligned. And now I can just do what I could have done in the first place if it was neat I'll hit load more just so you can see. So now it's got all the different headers that appear in all the different places. As it happens, the only one I'm interested in is employee ID. So I'm going to expand this table. Uh, and that's going to give me the employee. So you'll see now, because I've expanded it, this, you know, there was just one 2013-03. Now that's 35 rows, whatever the number we had before was. Yeah, 35 rows. And then it starts into the next quarter and so on down. And so now I can just delete everything else in between. And then I could just load that straight away. But because I'm not really interested in, in individual employees, I'm just in, interested in who was around from when to when. And again, in the real world, this wouldn't quite work. But in this case, we were told people just join, stay a certain length of time, and then they leave. So you can assume there's no, they leave, they come back, they leave, they come back, whatever. Uh, so I can just hit group by, and group by is sort of the equivalent of doing a pivot table, basically. So I'm gonna group by employee ID, and I'm gonna look at the min and, oops, sorry, the min and the max of this tab name, which is the date. Uh, so I'm gonna call the min first quarter, I'm gonna call the max last quarter, hit okay. And so now I have, okay, this guy was here from first quarter to the third quarter. But again, I'm still not really interested in the individual employee. So I'm just going to group again. 
group by first quarter and last quarter and do a count to see how many people match that. And so it says, okay, how many people joined in the first quarter of 2013 and finished in the third quarter four and so on down. Uh, and so then I just hit close and load. And it spins for a second, because like I said, my computer is very slow, but not for all that long. And then it gives you, okay, for every first quarter and every last quarter, here's the number of people uh, who started in that quarter and ended in that quarter. And then once you have that, uh, I mean, I won't dwell much on once you have that, because once you have that, that basically takes you to, uh, to where the sort of official solution starts. <clears throat> um, and then you can, you know, th there's a little bit more sort of summarizing to do to get the actual answers, but, you know, you can do a count ifs, you know, how many times is the last quarter 2020 12? That's whatever this number of people were on staff at that point, of which how many were hired in 2020? You're counting how many times is the last quarter 2020 12, and how many times is the first quarter 2020 followed by anything? And you get the percentage. You can summarize. The hard part is knowing is, is looking through all the questions and then figuring out what the quest, what data you're going to need to get that to, that you need for the data in order to answer the questions. Um, yeah, you sort of have to yeah, read the sure. whole thing first. Don't you? I agree with that because I I was I didn't get the idea fast enough that I only needed that one piece of information, the employee ID, I was trying to sort of incorporate it that I might need it for anything and, and having a more complex solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. So, I, I mean, look, it's, um, I, I definitely thought about, you know, asking questions about, I don't know, could you see different attrition patterns by where the people lived or something? And then I, in the end, I decided it was too, too much for the time. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about this is, Two things. One is, as you saw, you know, I, I ticked off everything except employee ID. But you know, if you wanted to pull in the address and the name and the email address, you know, structurally that part is the same. Then, you know, whether you aggregate it all the way up to, you know, just first quarter, last quarter, um, or actually for this one, I did, I did keep it at the employee ID level. But you know, wh whether you kind of roll it all up right away. Um, you know, depends on the kinds of questions you expect to have to answer for sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, because I didn't want to delete it. Something like this, I, I would. It. Sorry, go, I was go ahead. Worried that if I deleted a column, that I might need it later. So I left a lot more in than was necessary. Yep, yep. I, I mean, again, I, I would say, if, well, two things. One is, you know, it, it's a very different world. <laughs> Um, you know, what you do under exam conditions. And I, honestly, it's, I, I think it's one of the tactically hardest questions in a setup like this is trying to figure out, do I do this right? Or do I do this, you know, by hacking it together? And I, I've gone different ways at different, like between, you know, this and model off before it, I've done, you know, dozens and dozens of these. And there's no easy rule that I've found to figure out what is the best approach between the hack and the the neat solution. I've, I've tried both. I, I think I've basically got every every part of the two by two. I've tried the neat solution and had it work. I've tried the neat solution and had it fail. I've tried the hack and had it work and I've tried the hack and had it fail. Like, the upside of the hack is, you know, you can be pretty sure you know exactly how long it's going to take because if it takes you, you know, 10 seconds to copy and paste one tab, then it's going to take you that times whatever to copy and paste all of them. There's no, there's no benefits to scale, but there's also no extra cost. Whereas, you know, obviously the downside of that is if you make a mistake, you'll never know uh, if all you're doing is copy and value pasting. Like, you know, maybe one time you accidentally, you know, you go down to the bottom of where you were before, but you don't go to the first empty row, you go to the last row that had something in it, and then you've pasted over something and you, you'll never find that out, um, you know, no matter what you do. Um, and I, like I've had that, you know, I had it in the model of finals a few years, I, 
I think in the last one that I did before they kicked me out because they didn't want the dinosaurs in there anymore, um, where, you know, I, I, I forgot thought, that they did that. <laughs> I didn't forget. <laughs> um, I, let me turn off the screen share so I can see faces while we talk. Um, but yeah, I, I spent a bunch of time like, okay, I, I've done this before. I know how to do this. I think it was like, um, the, you know, whatever it was, there, there were like multiple entries in a cell, whatever comma separated. And so, you know, you, you had to kind of get them all into separate cells. And so I did it by doing text to columns and then like, you know, cut and paste this below that and this below that and this below that until it was all into one column and then whatever else I did after that. But at some point along the way, I stuffed it up. And so I did it pretty quickly and I probably did it faster than I would have done an efficient or like a sort of proper formula based solution that you, you know, that you would do if you were going to do it every week for the rest of your life. But then I ended up with wrong answers and I had to go back and do it again. And that hurt. So, I mean, you guys have all been very quiet. I don't know if you have any questions. I don't want to monologue too much. Um, power query practice. So my original power query practice um, was if you Google uh, city bike data, uh, city bike is like a bike sharing scheme in New York City. And they publish data on all the rides taken in the network uh, every month. And so it's like, basically the reason I tried it out was because I was like, oh, hey, this is some really interesting data that I would like to look at. But, you know, one busy month has more than a million rides. So you can't even open uh, one big month's file in Excel. Um, and so it was, it was the thing that prompt, like I'd heard of Power Query, but never used it. And I was like, okay, here's something where I can try this out. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a little bit like, what we just went through in that, you know, you're taking a whole bunch of, in this case, it was separate files, but separate tabs, separate files is pretty similar from a Power Query perspective and trying to mash them all together and then trying to do some, you know, data analysis with it. Um, so for example, the, um, let me get this right. So the original network had 250, I think it was 250 or so, uh, stations in Manhattan. Um, and so I did a thing to figure out when was the first time that somebody made any particular, any trip connecting some pair of stations. Um, and I found out that there were only two stations in the original network that had never had a trip taken between them. Uh, so then I went and got a city bike and rode between those. Uh, so now I'm, I will forever be the last person to take a unique ride between uh, between two stations in the original city bike network. Uh, so for example, uh, if, if you feel like a challenge, go download the city bike data. Uh, and there's an extra challenge because first you have to figure out which stations are Manhattan, um, which is kind of a combination. you know, if you, if you graph it, you'll be able to see what Manhattan looks like, but finding a neat way to pick those out, uh, is not totally straightforward. Um, but if you do it right and you crunch the numbers, you'll be able to find out when I made that trip. Uh, <laughs> so that's a challenge. Um, but yeah, that, that, was, that was a useful way for me to explore it just because you know, it's, it's a big enough data set that I was like, okay, clearly I can't do this with Excel, but it was also a very neat data set. It, you know, it was always the same columns in every month. Um, you know, it was very kind of structured and orderly. Uh, and so it was a good place to start. Um, but after that, I mean, once you get used to it, like I use Power Query loads. Um, I mean, basically for anything, anything where I'm getting the same data on a regular basis and trying to ask the same questions, you know, if, if it's totally straightforward, like, I don't know how many rows are there, then I'll just do it with a formula. But anything that starts to get more than that, I'll, I'll do most of that in Power Query these days. 
a good question from Kim asking how would you do it differently if you're building from some for someone else. So this was inspired by a real life case study, wasn't it? So um, how how does it how is it different to what you did in the real world? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so ordering someone else's query. Let me see if I don't. Okay, so oh, sorry, I was I was mixing these two together. Okay, so hang on. How would you do something like this, this differently if you're building for someone else? Um, I I think I would still probably do it that way. Um, like there there is there's a learning curve to being able to write Power Query queries. There's very little learning curve, especially for someone who has a newer version of Excel, to receiving a file or even refreshing a file that has queries in it. Um, so if, if you have Excel 2007 or older, which sadly my work still does because we're in the stone age, then you have to download Power Query as an add-in. So it, it's not just sitting there by default. I think from 2010 on, it's always there on the data tab. So anyone who has Excel, I, unless I, I don't, I don't know all the versions. I think maybe some of the like personals don't have it or something, but like I would suspect most people who have Excel in a business environment that's refreshed any time in the last decade will have Power Query. So it is it is quite portable. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would I would add some quick instruction with it on that, but I would, I would do it that way. Um, on the question about ordering a query, yes. I mean, any, any code, that needs to be read by another human being, uh, you know, you will get many, many karmic points if you add comments. Uh, and the way to do that in Power Query is just two, uh, two forward slashes at the start of a line, means that Power Query will, will ignore anything that comes on the rest of that line. Uh, I did not know that. Oh, wow, you, you got to know that. <laughs> um, yeah, like so it's- the, Like oh. the apostrophe in VDA. Exactly, exactly. Cool. And so like, where, where I find it helpful is, you know, I, I don't usually write a kind of, this is what this query is supposed to do, unless it's something quite formal that I'm handing off to someone else. But what I have, I have a lot of queries, like I, I do weekly reporting where I take whatever files from 20 or so different systems and sources and whatever and mash them together into, you know, management reports. And that that's, all, I mean, basically only possible because I do it through Power Query. Um, and so I have like 50 or so queries that just get refreshed every week, but I very rarely go in and edit them unless the structure of the underlying data changes. So I tend to put some comments on that, which will be something to the effect of, you know, at, like I'll put in a couple of line breaks in the advanced editor and then put a comment saying, whatever, this next section is identifying the outliers. This next section is, you know, whatever, pulling all transactions related to the outliers or, or whatever it is. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it, like there's obviously, there's a higher level of documentation required for I'm handing this off to somebody else than there is to, you know, I'm handing this off to me six months from now. But like what it takes for you to look back at it five minutes later and remember how it works versus six months later is definitely very different. Yeah. Stephanie, I see you've got your hand up. Did you have a question? Yes, I had a question. Like a lot of time doing those type of reports with Power Query, like you had, for example, the employee ID was always the same. And then the format of the employee ID was always the same. But sometimes what you see is that you can have, like you can pull data from different systems that sometimes don't necessarily use the same format, but also like over time the format change. How flexible is Power Query with that? Because I know like on this setting for model, if you want to do, not model, sorry, uh, the financial modeling World Cup, you want to do something that is doable, but like how flexible is Power Query when you change like format over time or you're taking like information from different system, but it's going to be like the same asset numbers that has a different format depending on the system. Yeah. So I, it's hard to give one single answer for that because the range of things that can be different from one system to another and how different they can be is very wide. 
um, like, for example, if you had, you know, one system where your employee IDs ended with a space and another where they didn't, um, as long as you know that, no problem. Like you can remove spaces in Power Query or I don't know if you're, you got social security numbers or something and they're, they're dash separated in one place and they're just straight numbers in another place. If, if you know what it is, that's, that's pretty easy to handle. Or the, the most common one, like I, I mash a lot of different files together in my weekly reporting. Um, you know, it's whatever, it's emp ID in files that come from HR, but it's employee ID in files that come from finance or it's HR ID in files that come from somewhere else. And sometimes it's formatted as text and sometimes it's formatted as a number. Um, you know, you, you need to know what that is. So in other words, you can't just tell it, here is employee ID in this file, find the equivalent column in another file. It's not that smart. Um, yeah. But if, if you know what the name of the equivalent column in the other file is, uh, you know, if it's formatted as text here or has a leading letter there or something like that, it, I would say 98 plus percent of that it's able to handle. Um, as, as long as you know what the rule is. If it's like the range of things that a human could understand to be whatever this person's email address where you might have might put in spaces, you might use the word at instead of a symbol or something like people do if they're trying to you know, make it hard for a computer to find it. Like humans are much more flexible, so, which is why I'm reluctant to say it can handle anything because you know, you can, you can get pretty complicated. Like it could not handle spelling mistakes in email address as well. That would be very difficult. Like you could write a complicated custom function to say how similar are these two email addresses based on a certain logic that might be flexible for typos, but that would be, you know, heavy customization. It couldn't handle that neatly. Um, but yeah, like different formatting, formatted as number versus text, different column name, that kind of thing. As long as it's consistent, it can handle that kind of thing, no problem at all. Okay. Great, well, we are just about to time. So um, we can probably handle one more quick question if there is anything else anybody would like. I've to got a quick on. one. Yes, Liliana. Um, I was wondering, besides Power Query, what other maybe less common Excel features would you recommend learning to give people an edge in these competitions? Good question. So, I mean, honestly, if, if you're thinking about edge in the competition, I actually wouldn't put Power Query that high up the list. Uh, I don't think I've ever used Power Query in, in the competition. Um, Interesting. There, are, there have been a couple of times when I thought I could have, um, but the challenge with Power Query in you know exam conditions is what I use regularly is a, a relatively narrow subset of it, and it is it is quite picky about certain things. So, like for example, in Excel. Excel doesn't care if something is a number or text or whatever. Like if you say, you know, one in quotation marks times three, it's like, oh yeah, sure. You meant to treat the one as text. If you say one in quotation marks times three in Power Query, it throws an error unless you first read. And, and if you're in a competition, like if you can't fix it, you're screwed basically. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so th there were, there've been a couple of times when I thought, I could use this if I was absolutely sure of the syntax and like if I could remember, like if I was able to Google formula syntax or something, I might, but I, I have never actually used it. Um, but having said that, you know, for real life, Power Query is by far number one on my list of things people don't think about using, but that they definitely should use. Um, for the competition, um, no, honestly, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I mean, like part of the part of the challenge with these things is they ask a very wide range of things. Like I, I would recommend looking at like if, if you're 
interested in, you know, doing better in the competition, I definitely recommend looking at either the past questions from this or the past questions from Model Off, um, which they're not on the Model Off website anymore, but I, someone told me you can find most of them on Eloquence. Um, or, you know, I'm sure they're out there in other places. Um, there's starting to be quite a few, quite a, a bank now with the um, FMWC uh, list of questions. So, you know, I think there's plenty to go through on there. Yep. I noted uh, that they said um, you can answer the questions using macros, but that, you know, you don't need to to answer anything. Have you ever used a macro in a competition? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, Normally a macro would be when you want to do something over and over again, I suppose. Yeah, that's, but that's just I, I think there was a lot of data with it, but... Yeah, so I, I think, I mean, data heavy questions have not historically been super common in model off. Um, and where they have been, it's like, okay, maybe there's a lot of data, but it's kind of one table. You don't have to, you know, merge and do funky stuff. Um, I think most of what I would think of as there's a lot of stuff here, I better do some code. These days I would do through Power Query rather than through VBA because I, I think it's more flexible. But yeah, I, I don't think I've ever used either VBA or Power Query in a, in a model of or FMWC round. Although I know others, I know others have definitely used VBA. Um, maybe a couple of people have used Power Query. Um, I mean, I, I only really know what people did in the finals, obviously. I don't really know what everybody did in the rounds. But yeah, I've, I've seen a few people use Power Query. I've definitely seen people use VBA. And uh, maybe just lastly, you could tell us any strategies that you have for keeping calm under pressure. Because the stakes for you are high. Like when I had a, a really hard one last month, I just kind of freaked out and went, ah, you know, <laughs> how do you yeah. sort of keep yourself calm? <laughs> I mean, th there's, there's like strategies for when it's going well and there's strategies for when it's going off the rails. <laughs> um, so I mean, I, I usually have some sense of like how I want to split my time, but it's, I mean, that's, that might be whatever. There's, there's a thousand marks, you know, maybe I'm aiming to be done a bit early. Let's say I want to do it in a hundred minutes. So I'll kind of roughly split it up based on that. Like I would, you know, from past form, I normally expect I'll go a little bit faster than average on the like speeded up questions, except that totally didn't happen last time. It took me a really long time. Um, but so like, I usually have some the sense always of with like, the horse. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, all of like my, my basic corporate finance theory is not like it's, it's in there somewhere, but it's not very fresh in my mind. So, you know, I, I forgot to subtract the cash on the question about figuring out the valuation and banged my head against that one for quite a while. Um, and I don't know, I made other silly mistakes as well. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I usually have some sense in my head in advance of like, I'd like to be done with this one by this time and this one by this time. But if it's not work, I mean, I, I will say, I think there's some skill in knowing when to pull the plug if it's not working. Like, I think if you get stuck in a rut, the, the way they do it with this one, where there's like one question that's short and all separate questions, it's it's kind of more straightforward. But you know, let's say you've done the speedy ones and then you get stuck in question one, like having a sense of when is it time to bail out and go get what I can on the other question. It, it's quite tricky because the way it works is often, you know, you do 80% of the work if you're building it in a, a kind of neat way, you do 80% of the work and you've got 10% of the marks, but then the last little bit will suddenly unlock. Okay, I've completed my model. Now I can answer all these other questions. And so it may be worth, you know, sticking at it, even if you feel really stuck. Whereas if you start the next question, you might only have time to do the first 80% of that. But there definitely been times when I've been like, wow, I was glad that I pulled out of that one before I went into a black hole for the remaining two hours trying to debug this thing um but yeah like i said it's it's hard and i mean when i get stuck i usually i usually try to like 
pick some number and just work to it from a different approach or like flesh out, you know, compact formulas, just spread them out as much as I can and see if I get the same answer. But that's, that is far from always successful. Right. I think we're going to have to leave it there. We, uh, we're pretty much out of time. Thank you so much, Demma. That was, uh, was really, really helpful um, and really useful for a lot of us, I think. Um, so what we've got this week uh, coming up, we have got a public session uh, with Ruby Lou. So I'm looking forward to that one on Wednesday. And then next Monday, at uh, a little bit later than this time, um, we'll be hearing from Hedia Kianiford uh, in Paris. She's going to be talking about financial modelling as a career or just as a stepping stone, because I, I think it's an interesting topic because people often see financial modelling as being um, just a, a sort of very junior role and something to, uh, to step forward to rather than being a career in and of itself. So um, I'm looking forward to that one. So thank you, Dim. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we sign off? I was just going to say thank you for having me. And, you know, I... It's, it's a group I'd really like to see succeed. So, you know, if, if there's ever anything I can do to help, feel free to, feel free to shout. Thank you so much. All right. See everybody soon. Bye-bye.